Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to get new video updates. Welcome to the Moth Podcast. I'm Brandon Grant, your host this week. Folks stuck at home during the pandemic sought comfort in so many different ways. Maybe you fancied yourself a sourdough artist, not me, mm -mm. or danced with your friends on Zoom, definitely, definitely me. But even with all of the distractions we created, so many people still felt there was something missing. And so they took to social media and to animal rescue websites to find their perfect dog. My family is one of those households. In mid-July, my boyfriend and I, nervous as hell, drove from Harlem to the Grover Cleveland rest stop off I-95 in New Jersey to meet our dog, Billy. We found her through a wonderful rescue group called Wag On In who brought her all the way from Louisiana to join her family. We knew she was our baby girl from the moment we saw her beautiful brown eyes and loving smile. Billy is rambunctious, she enjoys a good belly rub, and has a deep, deep passion for chasing squirrels. And while it hasn't been smooth sailing acclimating her to big city living, thank God for trainers, she's the piece of our puzzle we never knew was missing. So this week, I'm happy to share two stories all about the love we have for and the love we receive from the dogs who chose us. Our first storyteller this week is Linda Fontania. Linda told this at a story slam in Seattle where the theme of the night was love hurts. Just a heads up, for anyone who may be sensitive, Linda's story does contain mentions of suicide. Here's Linda. The happiest moment in my life was when I jumped into my husband's arms and I got back home from Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he picked me up from Fort Benning, Georgia, if you know where that is. It's like the armpit of America. And we drove to DC where I was stationed. I was so excited to see Gina. So I had seen a ton of uh, YouTube videos where the dogs and the soldiers reunite and it's always so heartwarming and I was going to experience that for myself. So, <laughs> I saw Gina and she barked at me because <laughs> she hadn't seen me in like six or seven months and she came to, she came home and it would always be an empty house. And then she saw me and she was just like, oh, oh, that's my person. So she came up to me and ran up to me and she had her tail wagging just enthusiastically. And she came up to me and kissed me and circled me. So that was, that was wonderful. So. The next day, Adam, my husband, uh, went to work at a bookstore. And it was uh, getting renovated, so I figured he was really busy and had a lot of work to do. I, on the other hand, had a lot of days off. So the Army does a really good job at preparing you for deployment, like with TBI tests and like anti-PTSD stuff. So uh, I was not ready to come back home. I was really lonely and alienated. And I found out that I had a back injury, so I couldn't run or do yoga or do any of those things that I like to do for stress relief. So, but what I did was I walked to Gina a ton and I played fetch with her and I read books about war stories because I felt connected to the people in the, the books and stuff. But Adam was acting a little strange. Um, he would come home late and he would be really withdrawn and quiet and stuff. So I sat him down and I was just like, what is up? And he said, you were gone and I liked it. I never wanted to be married to you. So, so yeah, um, so it, it didn't work out. Uh, he... The only reasons he gave me were, you don't read enough, you're not artistic enough. So, <laughs> so, yeah, but divorce was still really hard for me. I mean, I thought I was going to be with him for the rest of my life. Um, so I remember deciding to buy a nice purple climbing rope from REI. And I was going to logistically figure out, I was going to go on a walk with Gina, and logistically I was going to figure out which tree to hang myself on. 
So I finally found, found a tree, and the base of the tree had, was big enough so I could tie it and uh, anchor me, that is, and with a branch that was low enough for me to throw a bulky rope over it and then high enough for me so if I jumped, I wouldn't be able to save myself because of my height if I was indecisive or something. And then Gina found the stick. And usually that means that you gotta stop whatever you're doing because you gotta throw the stick. So I threw the stick and she came back to me and she had the biggest smile and enthusiastically wagging tail. And that moment I knew that I had to take care of her and she was going to take care of me. So the army decided to move me across the country to Washington State. And I told Adam that I wanted to take Gina with me because she was my best friend during this really dark time. He told me he couldn't say no to me. So we moved here. Uh, Washington State is, there's something so transformative about living here and that's, I don't know if it's the air, the views, the mountain, it was, fant it was fantastic. It's been fantas fantastic. Um, so after a year of living here, the Army said, you're going to deploy again. So I sent Gina to stay with my family down in San Diego. Um, my dad really enjoyed it. He said that he had found a partner to keep him healthy because my mom was not going to be doing that. <laughs> and um, yeah, so a after a couple weeks, the Army said, just kidding, you got canceled for that deployment. So I went down to Retriever. So my dad was just like, hey, can I have your dog? And I said, no, but you could, <laughs> you, you know, like, <laughs> I, I said, no, but you could, like during the flu season, I work a ton, so, and I'm going to be working on grad school and stuff, so you could keep her for a couple months. So flu season came around and I sent Gina down to San Diego. This time I didn't go with her. Uh, she, uh, my parents noticed that she was drinking a lot of water and that she was really tired and we thought like she was really anxious from the flight and just really tired. So the next afternoon my mom decided to cook her bacon and Gina came up to her and she collapsed and that was it. Um, yeah, the next couple days were a blur and they were fucking painful. I knew I had to tell one person who loved her as much as she, sorry, as, as she, uh, I did, and that was Adam. So I told him, and I told him about how I got her certified in therapy, uh, how, because it was something that we talked about, uh, hiking, and I, I said I was sorry for letting him down. He talked about his life that involved art and books, and, <laughs> He said I didn't let him down. Though we grew apart in passions, we loved, we, we had the same love for a wonderful, amazing dog. I am so thankful that I had her. She saved me. Through her, I learned about focus, joy, and true love. Thank you. That was Linda Fontania. Then captain, Linda served as an army nurse for nine years. She left the army to attend graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania. Linda, now Dr. Torres, has volunteered on the board of veteran service organizations, including Team Foster, a nonprofit that links veterans to service dogs. She currently lives near Philadelphia with her husband and golden retriever, Ari. To see some photos of Linda and her late dog, Gina, head to the extras for this episode on our website, themoth.org slash extras. September is Suicide Awareness Month. To see a list of resources for folks who may be struggling, visit the extras for this episode on our website. Our next storyteller is Beth Bradley. Beth told this at a story slam in Denver where the theme of the night was magic. Here's Beth live at The Moth.
So, Susie was not a perfect dog, but she was our dog and we loved her. My mom first laid eyes on her at the animal shelter and she just fell in love with Susie's cute little foxy face and she had this curly tail and thick black fur. So my whole family, my dad, my mom, and my two sisters and I headed over there to see if we had a good vibe with Susie. And I do remember that the animal shelter lady pointed out she was worried that my dad and Susie might not be bonding that well. And that was probably true. My dad is not my, that much of an animal person and kind of thinks of pets as just like another hassle to deal with. But as usual, the rest of us overruled my dad and we got to bring Susie home and she became our first family dog. So to be fair, Susie really could be kind of a hassle. Her favorite hobby was uh, barking at anyone that dared to walk by our house. And uh, the other thing she liked to try to do was escape. So one time she actually combined those hobbies and uh, she launched herself through the front window of our house through the screen <laughs> in pursuit of some strangers. Um, so we had to go lower her back into our house. But on the other hand, she could be very sweet. So like one time I remember in high school, I had broken up with a boyfriend and I was crying and uh, Susie came and just like leaned up against me and I could tell she was like, you know, I got your back. So, but over the years, my dad's feelings towards Susie didn't really warm up. He kind of just tolerated her, generally thought of her as pretty annoying. But, uh, and honestly, my dad could make my sisters and I feel that way too sometimes. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it was, he was, it was hard to ask him for help and he could kind of, uh, you know, respond to us in the same way that he was annoyed with Susie the dog. But one night, we were all sitting down to dinner. We were gonna get to watch uh, TV and eat dinner at the same time in the TV room, which was a big deal. So we're all getting set up and we notice Susie's nowhere. And so one other thing about Susie is like, she might not have been as into us as we were into her. <laughs> so she really just mainly liked waiting at the window for people to bark at. But uh, dinner time was one time she would deign to be with us because she liked to eat the crumbs off the floor. So it was very suspicious that she wasn't around. So we're calling for her, we're like, Susie, Susie, she's not coming. So we, we figure she must be outside. So my two sisters and I go outside to look for her. We're calling for her some more. We don't, uh, we don't see her, but we do see this little shape toward the back of the yard. So we're running toward it, and as we get closer, we hear this kind of like weird, low wheezing sound. And we get there, we see that it's Susie, and it's her little limp body. She's laying there, and she's actually gotten her head stuck in a with a drain from the house. And she's suffocating. So we are panicking, we're screaming for my parents, they run outside, and it's kind of a blur, like my mom finds the kitchen scissors to actually like cut her out of this tube, and we free her. But by that time, she's not breathing, and we're just panicking. So my dad scoops her up, and I just remember her little head just kind of lolls to the side, and her eyes had kind of glassed over. So we run inside the house, and just like total pandemonium, crying, trying to find the vet's number. My dad's just sitting there on the couch holding her, and we're kind of looking at him. He's looking up at us, and without saying anything, he cups his hand around Susie's snout, and he puts his mouth on her mouth, and he blows. <laughs> and then he does it again. <sighs> and we're just in like total stunned silence. <laughs> and another thing to know about Susie is we had seen her eat like a lot of disgusting crap in her life. <laughs> <laughs> like she literally would eat crap and um, like, you know, dead birds and that kind of thing. So I really would like to know the animal, shelter's lady, animal shelter lady's opinion of their bond <laughs> in that moment. Um, so he does it a few more times, he blows a few more times, and then it was like a spell lifted, Susie's eyes like pop open, like I see the life just flood into them, just like Sleeping Beauty or something. And she's kind of blinking and my dad sets her down. We're all just like in complete shock. Susie's looking up at us like, what? <laughs> and we have the vet on the phone by that time and we're explaining what happened. And he's like, well, is she like walking around and everything? And we're like, yeah. And he's like, I think she's okay. <laughs> so <laughs> she was, she was okay. And she actually lived a very long time after that. She lived a very happy life. Uh, she became old enough to become incontinent, actually, and like, um, <laughs> she, 
she, uh, so my, that was one more thing my dad got to deal with was changing Susie's dog diapers. <laughs> um, but I've thought a lot about uh, that moment in the years since, like my dad looking up at us and us looking at him. And I don't think that he realized his love for her and that's what made him kiss our dog on the mouth. <laughs> I think that he really just couldn't stand to see our hearts broken and he did it because he loved us. So I think dogs are not perfect, dads are not perfect, but love itself is perfect. And sometimes it even gives you magic powers. <laughs> That was Beth Bradley. Beth Bradley is a marketing content director who lives in Denver. She loves adventure of all kinds and has been telling stories since she could talk. Beth and her two sisters all have their own dogs now, and all three grand dogs unabashedly adore Beth's dad. To see some photos of Beth, her dad, and Susie the dog, head to our website, themoth.org extras. And while you're there, you'll also find photos of my family, including Billy, our newest member. Whether you have a dog, cat, iguana, or fish, we hope these stories remind you of the joy and love that animals bring to the world. That's all for this episode. From all of us here at The Moth, have a story-worthy and woof-worthy week. Brandon Grant is a proud Jamaican-American queer man, devout Harlemite, and director of marketing for The Moth, but he counts his favorite titles as being dog dad to Billy and uncle to Kai and Quest. This episode of The Moth Podcast was produced by Sarah Austin Janess, Sarah Jane Johnson, Julia Purcell, and me, Davey Sumner. The rest of The Moth's leadership team includes Katherine Burns, Sarah Haberman, Jennifer Hickson, Meg Bowles, Kate Tellers, Jennifer Birmingham, Marina Cluche, Suzanne Rust, Brandon Grant, Inga Gladowski, and Aldi Kaza. All Moth stories are true as remembered by storytellers. For more about our podcast, information on pitching your own story, and everything else, visit our website, themoth.org. The Moth Podcast is presented by PRX, the public radio exchange, helping make public radio more public at prx.org. <laughs>